Lord, as we recognise that we are in and you are present with us. Recognise that you can speak to us. You're always speaking to us. Our failure is hearing. Help us to hear. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'd like to turn to Mark chapter 7, verse 31 to 37. I'm going to cause acting grief. I'm going to cause acting grief. <sighs> Last week, Steve uh, talked fantastically well. Uh, is he here? Oh, well, I better lower down my compliments. Um, no, Steve spoke fantastically well on identity and our identity in Jesus, our identity in Christ. Do you remember that? Who was here? And he had that picture, what I thought was an amazing picture of that uh, young lady with projected onto her words, negative words, about how she thought about herself. And he talked about that we, in Christ, if we get our identity in Christ, those sort of negativity disappears. I hope you've been reflecting on that through the week. But it goes beyond that into something else, which we're going to look at now in Mark Chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Now, I somehow seem to be slowly going through the Gospel of Mark with you. And when we last left it, if you may remember, can anybody remember when we last left Mark? What did I all call you at one point? Sorry? Dogs, exactly. Do you remember that? Your dogs. The woman begging Jesus to heal uh, or to get rid of the demon that was inside her daughter and Jesus started calling her a dog. Do you remember we unpacked the Greek of all of that and what he was really sort of calling her was like the household type of dog, a part of the family coming in. And remember I was talking about my cat Toffee, how I made that connection, you're still to this day wondering. So am I, because it wasn't in any of my notes. But the fact that, like my cat, who keeps persisting every morning, as he did again this morning, for his food, nearly tripping me up again, walking down the stairs again. I think he wants me to meet Jesus a lot quicker than I do. Um, but persisting to get his food constantly at my feet. And what I give him, as a good owner, is give him the best for him. Not necessarily what he wants, but most certainly what he needs. If I fed him on McDonald's every day or any other fast food chain food, that wouldn't do him much good, would it? But if I give him what he needs, what is nourishing and 100% good for him, it's the best thing. So we can persist at God, but we need to be listening to him because maybe what we're persisting for is not necessarily what is good for us and what we need. And our heavenly, loving, perfect Father gives us what we need, not, necess not necessarily what we want. By the way, some people then translate that into anything that's like a fun or a desire that you have, or a particular passion. God doesn't want you to have that. That's not true. We sometimes have those things in us because actually it's what God says you need. It's part of you. It's good for you. So therefore then enjoy it and have it and do it and, and enjoy that hobby or whatever else. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all the time that things that we really enjoy are what we need. Sorry, I can't get over this cup. I, I did ask it to be left there because originally I was going to let it... I looked at it and, and I know you can't see it, but I, I'm, I'm going to point it out to you. It's here. Here you go. Okay. And I, there's, something, there's, there's something about that cup that I'm sitting there saying, there it is, alone. Yes, I know it's empty now, but there it is. And actually, half of us either would ignore it because we don't want it. But if it was full, it's, 
almost like a representation of how we think God is with us. Here's all this vast space, but he'll give us this much of a blessing. That's all there is for us in the kingdom of God, is, is a cup full. That's not the gospel I'm reading. If, if you thought like that this morning, or God might just not have enough to go around, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there was actually, the picture was there was this massive... I just if the word used was cauldron, appropriate for Halloween, isn't it? But there was this uh, massive vat of it, basically, and yet I think we treat the kingdom of God when we persist in prayer, something like that. So I'm not going to tip it upside down, there are some dregs in it. And probably That's probably how we think God sees us sometimes, is dregs in the bottom of a cup, and he doesn't. Anyway, got nothing to do with the sermon, but that's how you reflect. Somebody wants to take that to the kitchen later, I'll be grateful. It's not mine. So the lesson should be that we can boldly go to the throne room and request something for God. So let's read on. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. Remember, Jesus is in Gentile land. The Jewish Messiah... The Jewish saviour is in Gentile land. And if you remember where he was earlier on, they were effectively long-term dispute. And so really for the Jewish Messiah to be in Gentile land was a little bit, mm, bit odd. Anyway, there he is on a very long 120 mile journey. By the way, that journey I've just read to you in one verse leaving Tyre, going to Sidon, then going back to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Ten Cities. A 120-mile trip, that was. Took longer than two hours, because they didn't have cars then. It was on the M25, so it took about four. But it was a 120-mile journey, not a straightforward route. Why? Well, this is uh, us seeing that actually that the Jewish Shire say val- say. Salvation, which will come from the Jews, is also available for the Gentiles, which we saw with the woman wanting the scraps, effectively the scraps off the table. And Jesus argued. So you get in the same image here. So this is now coming on from that story of scraps at a table to, well, the Jewish Messiah spent this long walking around the Gentile land, showing how much blessings of the kingdom of God are for those outside of the Israelite, the Jewish nation. That's what you got here. Carrying on. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Abathana, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak speak plainly. Might need some of that myself this morning. (laughs) Jesus told the crowd, you only only verbalise what you're already thinking. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. So good at obeying our Lord Jesus, aren't we? They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Wow. He's in Gentile land. I want to go back to another place. If you could just keep your finger where you are. But flip back a couple of chapters to chapter 5. Round about verse 17. I am not... uh, Verse 15, let's actually just go to verse 15. So, uh, Jesus is in... This is the great 2,000 pig moment. No, demons are cast out of one man into 2,000 pigs and they go and drown themselves. We're going to just come to the end of that. A crowd, soon gathered, a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. 
He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Okay? Flick two chapters forward after a 120-mile journey. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus to lay there his hands on the man to heal him. Whoa, there's two different reactions now to Jesus, isn't there? Two different reactions. Originally, the gent, no, oh, we're scared, go away, get out of our land. And he did, and then he returns here in Mark. And actually, they're bringing this person along, this, this deaf and speech impeded man, impeded man, and says, Jesus, we beg you, lay hands on him. There's a turnaround. Knowing Jesus can be like that sometimes, or sometimes we're scared of the idea, because it makes zero sense to us. We might be in a church where we see God doing stuff. Scary. We don't tend to say to, well, I don't know, sometimes churches can turn around to God and say, go away. <laughs> We're not coping very well with this. But then years down the line, months down the line, there can be a turnaround when you are desperate and in need of hope, you turn to God. You turn to Jesus. There is nothing else left. Obviously, this crowd after this 120 mile journey are really hearing this great stuff that this Jesus is doing, not just the miracles, but probably also the teaching. And so they hear this speech impeded man, deaf man who needs Jesus. For me, what's really important to note is that the people are like my cat. They're begging Jesus to do something good, to give the best to this man. Lay your hands on him. And what's even more important for me is actually they're bringing somebody along and saying, Jesus, Jesus, put your hands on him. They're not going up saying, Jesus, Jesus, put your hands on me. They're going, Jesus, put your hands on him. Bought this man for you to bless him. Not me. Him. Now there is the argument that here that they're still after watching a miracle worker and they want to see a miracle just happen. But I think there's an element of here with people there that know that there's no more hope for this man other than this miracle healer to heal this man. And they've not gone there for selfishness for them. They've gone here for this man, man. I wonder, what does that mean for us today? Right, that's a question. I'm doing this because I had requested a microphone earlier. I said I was going to give Akin some trouble, didn't I? But just think for a man, what does that mean for you today then? To think about the fact, bringing somebody to Jesus for them, not for you. What does that mean? We'll do that for a minute. Um, it means that they will come, maybe come to know Jesus or they may get healed or you may see if we can pray about situations and we are in a privileged position okay. to do that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Your prayer life. My prayer life. How often is your prayer life about you and improvement of your life?
asking the question, not expecting anybody to put their hands up and say, wow, yeah, you're right. But we're very individualistic in our mindset. And to be honest with you, we're very selfish. We humans, we do tend to be rather centered around self. I remember the time I finally discovered that the Greek for I was ego. And boy, do I have a big one. And don't we all? And for me, that really captured the fact that I think in our modern society today, we do spend a lot of our prayer time thinking about moi. That's French, if you haven't, for me. Badly pronounced. But how often do we bring others before God, genuinely wanting to see God do something in their life? And we're rather persistently beg Jesus for them than totally worry about us. So how do you spend your time? I'm having this uh, conversation on Friday with, uh, 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 with Andy Robertson, and we, we would talk about offering and things like that. And people say, oh, yeah, well, you should give time to this and to that and don't have the time. And then you work out, well, how much time do I sit watching the TV? And is that good stewardship of time? It's not a condemning thing, but think about the fact that how often, how often do I bring family members, friends or whatever to God in prayer? Or how much do I sit there talking about me? And we're right to talk to God about us, but when uh, uh, Steve was talking about the image of God and our image of God and, and how we self-image and our identity in Christ, it's not just about me. That's, that's part of the puzzle, but actually you're to do exactly what it says in that song. We're a blessing. To, we are blessed to be a blessing to a world in pieces. I mean, that was Israel's role. That was the Jewish people's role, by the way. When the covenant was made with Abraham, you're to be a blessing to all nations. It is now those who are followers of Christ. That's their role. The church is now to be a blessing to others. And that's our role. We're where heaven touches earth. Amen? 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 Amen. And we like that noise. But the point is, we're to touch where people are hurting. We're to be the place where people have no hope. So, just wondering about your prayer life. Like me, sometimes you have to examine it every now and again, just to make sure. So, we have this deaf man with a speech impediment. Now, it isn't clear, quite frankly, if this speech impediment is because he is deaf or he also has uh, something wrong within his tongue and his speech. Because we know that people that can be deaf, you're, when you listen to them speak, sometimes it doesn't, you know, to our ears, it sounds a bit, clearly a bit different. We don't know here if that's the case. But what we do know is what we see that takes place. So, I need a volunteer. Steve, thank you. Stand. Did you clean your ears out today? No, no. Okay. So, so I'm not going to do the whole, don't panic. What are we doing? Well, you're the deaf speech impediment man. Okay. Is that okay? I can't hear you. No, 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 no. Steve, 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 Steve. I'm not Wendy. That's not an excuse you can use with me. Can't, still can't hear you. Thanks, head up. So, Jesus, effectively, so far as we can make out, takes his fingers, sticks it in the man's ears. I'm not going to do it, it's okay. Uh, do, do it, do it. No. I love you, mate, but not that much. So that, and then he puts spittle on his fingers and touches, stick his tongue out, and touches the man's tongue. Yeah. So I've got you going. You really thought I was going to do it then? You thought I was going to do it, didn't you? It's all right, mate. Yeah. Sit down. Can't hear you. Sit down. <laughs> but this is the best thing. What did I do? Come here, Steve. Sorry, stand up again. Here. Here. <laughs> do you know, never get somebody like Steve to help you out. It's okay. fatal, isn't it? Right. Kevin learned that lesson. Get me up there early. Right. But notice this, that Jesus takes him away from the crowd. 
takes him out to be on his own. You right? <laughs> Stay there for a minute. Jesus takes him out to be on his own. What's this signifying? What is so important about Jesus taking him away from the crowd to be on his own? This is a real question. I expect a real answer, please. Now I've got a microphone. Thanks, Akin. I think this is one-to-one -one with him and Christ instead of any other distraction with the crowds. Okay, one-to-one -one with him and no distraction, Jess? Also to reflect on what had just happened to him. Okay, to reflect on what's just happened. It hadn't happened at that point, sorry, it's me. I've reversed it around the wrong way. That's my fault in my imagery. Um, there's a reason why we ask people to sit at the front. He didn't want anyone else to see what was going on then. Possibly, yes, okay, maybe, but we'll see in a minute we're coming back, yeah? It's going to be a bit hard afterwards to not notice there's suddenly a change in the man. Sorry, thank you. I think it was for the man as well, so that he's actually showing him that he's loved. Do you know what I mean? He's giving him a, that special time. Yeah. Bingo. That's... Every the other answer was great, but that's probably the key one for this particular moment. He's actually... Jesus sidles the man off to say, do you know how important you are as an individual to me? It's not just that you're part of a nation. It's not that you've just been born into it. You're actually important to me right now. You, this person, are vitally important. You need to know that you stand as an individual on your own. You're not worthless just because you're deaf or you have a speech impediment. You are incredibly important. You are worthy of time, etc., etc., etc. Got it? Go and sit down without making a comment. I can hear now. Go and sit down without making a comment. Do you see the point? I'm going to split you lot up. Spreads to the four corners of the earth, or at least the whole. Right. But do you see the point? That's why. How important, how amazing is that? Just, just get that into your head for a minute. How amazing is that? That Jesus took... A Gentile as well, somebody who's seen by society as almost worth nothing because pretty useless, can't hear anything, and has a speech impediment. Couldn't think he was that worthless because they were dragging him along. And I'm not going to unpack the rest of that, but anyway. That is amazing, isn't it? Jesus is saying it doesn't matter who or you are, whether you've got what is perceived as a a disability of some nature or you're the best thing since sliced bread as far as the world is concerned. To me, right now, before me, you're important. I'm taking you out of the crowd so you recognise that you can have a one-to-one -one with God. Moses had a one-to-one -one with God quite often. Read Exodus 33. But you can have a one-to-one. -one. This morning when we were talking about recognising you in the presence of God, some probably, probably thought, in the church, yes, he's here. But he's sort of... I need people... He's sort of... He's in with this person here and this person here, but sort of half avoiding me, sort of hovering over me, rather than in me, and that important. And you can have a one-to-one -one with the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And there should be a resounding amen at that moment. Amen. And Atkins keeps saying, could you please stop standing in the wrong place? I think that's amazing. Personal attention. And you can have that 24-7. In the dog woman story, it's the only way I can summarise it in one hit, Jesus never sees the girl. He does it from afar. Here, Jesus shows compassion with the deaf man by physical contact. He's unafraid to be connected with the low and sometimes the ritually unclean. When he touches that man, he's doing a whole bunch for Jews, a whole bunch of taboos. But Jesus is unafraid to be associated with those in need, those whom society would tend to genuinely avoid. We bang on that about here. 
We heard it all this morning, didn't we? About the big sleep out. Homelessness. This wasn't... But being asked to maybe spend one night in a stadium or an athletics club, in a cardboard box, with others who are like-minded and there for the same reasons. One night. And I can assure you, halfway through the night, you'll recognise, you know, I'll be going home to a warm sofa in a minute and a warm bed. But then if somebody genuinely is homeless and you, God's asking you to go up and talk to them, will you? He's unafraid to be with those who are not like me. What I like about the dog woman girl, she's released, healed by Jesus from afar, not because he didn't care, but I think there's an element of here showing that God's power is everywhere. And sometimes you can be praying for someone and you don't need to physically be there for God to do something. I like the two stories together. It almost shows a juxtaposition of the whole roundedness of what God can do. There are times he's expecting us to go up to people and physically touch them and be with them and sit with them. Others, he's sort of saying, well, you know about them, so just pray for them from far. You may not know them even personally. You may never know them, but you know about their situation. You've heard about it. Pray for them. I see it sometimes when you get sensitised to the news on the BBC News and you things, hear things about, say, I think this morning, Aleppo again, it's all kicked off. And you've got Aleppo. And you sit there and you think, well, I don't know anybody from there. But so what? You know, there's something going on. Just lift up the people of Aleppo. Pray from afar. So spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue, looked up to heaven, he sighed. Ever wonder what the sigh bit means? Anyone got any idea what the sigh bit means? He sighed. Do we know what the significance of that is? Or did you just skip over it? Well, like I have done for nearly 20 years. He sighed. I cut this conclusion, Debbie. I just thought I'd mention this. I'm really pleased you're answering. Come forward. No. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, when you sigh about something, doesn't it mean like he was sad or maybe like sad about his situation, maybe like have an empathy. Empathy, compassionate. Yeah. yeah, okay, brilliant. Yeah. Anybody else? No, it's fine. Pretty much along the same things you were saying in the sense of um, he just he just touched on the need of the, the people, the real deep need of the people and that person at that time. So it's like, oh Lord. I mean, he's Lord himself, but it's like, Lord have mercy. He was willing to put himself out there and for the people, be compassionate to their situation and stick himself. Actually, sorry, why are you two, I just realised you two are sat together. That's really brilliant. Could you both stand? <laughs> sorry, I just thought you'd like an example of what it means to meet the people's need and be compassionate and put yourself out there for other people. Samantha and Alison. <laughs> Alison we've known for immensely long time. Even I knew Alison when I wasn't even a Christian. I was just coming into Greenford Baptist Church. Okay? And Samantha's a fairly new member. But you ready for these two? Who's heard of street pastors? Who's heard of street pastors? Ealing Street Pastors, yes? You're looking at two of their newest members from Greenford Baptist Church who are in the training at the moment to be street pastors out to stupid o'clock at night, sacrificing their time to be with people who you don't know who you're going to bump into, do you? I think a round of applause for them. Alison won't mind me saying this. But when Alison told me what she was doing, having known Alison, and most people will consider Alison to be sort of shy, quiet, reserved. When she told me what she was doing, all I could do was go, wow. 
That's God moving, and that's somebody willing to be moved by the Spirit of God and willing to obey. Samantha, we're getting to know more and more. Part of the reason she wants to come to this church, don't mind me, come to this church is because of that and what we believe about being on the streets. Just thought, mention that. So anyway, so the, it's just because you two are together, it made sense. So there is compassion there. This sighing is this sense of compassion for God. And there's two ways of looking at it. A sympathising Jesus. He takes the condition of the man to his own heart. Jesus never heals with a half-hearted attitude. Never recognise that. Jesus, when he's taken a situation or somebody on board and their condition, he never takes it with a sense of half-heartedness. He goes all out. The second is this, that the Gospel of Mark is all about conflict. It's about battle. And here we have, for me, the warrior Jesus engaging in battle with sickness. And he brings and restores hope. So that sighing is that sense of a sigh, and one commentator put it, and I was really, I'd be up front, I was really surprised to read it in the particular commentary I was reading it in. I didn't think they'll use this sort of language. But it's a sighing of a battle. To say enough is enough. Looking up to heaven, because that's where my help comes from, that's where the authority comes from, that's where the power comes from, and engaging in battle to make something happen. And when you engage in battle, one should never do it half-heartedly. Do it half-heartedly, guarantee you'll lose. And there's also, for me, when I read this sign, is that, that whole passage from Romans about, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, or put sighing there if you want, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. I'll skip down. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Sighing. Shouting, be opened. It is all, none of it is done half-heartedly. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Now, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone. And that's what I mean by the fact that I don't think Jesus took him off so nobody saw what he did. Because clearly the crowd saw, must have seen an element of what he did. Or else they wouldn't have known that the speech of the man could suddenly open his mouth. But Jesus didn't do it half-heartedly. Ever done that after somebody's offloaded to you and you've gone, I'll be praying for you. And you get about ten steps and you forgot. Who's ever done that? Don't put your hands up. Sort of a half-hearted prayer. Maybe we don't also know exactly what it is that God's going to want to do and how he's going to want it come about. I do like the coverall prayers. And we all do it, I do it, we all do it. But the cover all prayers, say that somebody for healing. Lord, we want you to heal this person right now in the name of Jesus. Bring power upon them, heal them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And when they go to the doctor, Lord, guide the doctor's hands, give them the right pills. Or maybe when they go to bed tonight, they'll feel better in the morning, Lord. Do Do you see what I mean by the cover all prayer? Nothing wrong in the cover all prayer, what it means is we're not actually sure what God's will here is at the moment and how God will answer that prayer and by what means he will answer the prayer. 
I think when Jesus pulled the man to one side, said, you're really important. He already had a clue how the father wanted to heal. Remember, Jesus said, I'm only doing what the father wants me to do. Jesus didn't take things on for his own board. He listened to the father. Problem is, we don't know God's will. I'm going to give you a really quick story. Four years ago, when I was in, in, uh, in uh, a mission trip in Nepal, one of the many things, we got taken off to villages a lot uh, by the Nepalese pastors there, would take us off to go and pray for people. And there was a particular person they wanted us to pray for, uh, a very sick person who, who was roughly in their mid-30s, uh, had uh, children, and they wanted us to go and pray for this person, incredibly ill. And I'll be upfront with you, I'd never been in that situation before and I didn't know quite what to do. Well, I did. I went, God, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and so easy, the answer would have been, can you actually, you know, start praying for healing? Yeah? Stood there, heard God very clearly say, don't pray for healing. I'm taking her home. Hardest thing to think, because again, we pray for what we want, maybe not necessarily what is needed. And it's a tough one. Five days later, the Lord took her home. We heard the report. Now, I am not saying we do not pray for healing and we do not want and put, present to God our request of what we would like to see happen. Jesus did it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did he not? You know, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but your will be done. I think that we sometimes need to look at our prayer life and wonder if we needed to learn to groan in the spirit. What I mean by that is not speaking in tongues, but allowing God's spirit that lives in each and every one of us who are Bible-believing Christians, who are followers of Jesus Christ, to allow that spirit to inspire us, to allow that spirit to speak to us, to allow the spirit to groan into God's creation, into situations for others and sometimes for ourselves as well. To try and get what God's will actually is, to be listening to him. And that is, I will agree, my brothers and sisters, the toughest thing, especially when we want something to happen in a particular way because we think it's the best for that person or the best for us or the best for a wider bunch of people. And God's saying, well, actually, no, what looks like the worst situation isn't. Actually, ultimately, long term, will be the best. And we need to listen to our God. We live in a very instant credit card society, do we not? Want it? Hand over a card, get it, thank you very much. Need something delivered? Well, these days it can be with you by six o'clock this evening if you've ordered it before midday. We're very much like that, and we're like that with God sometimes. Answer this prayer how I want it. I know it's going to resolve all this other situation around it. And God's saying, no, actually, if I do it my way, There'll be a long-term effect and there will be some instant pain and there might well be this awfulness, but actually the long-term effect is much better than the instant delivery that you want. And that hurts us. Now, I know here in this passage, he healed this man instantly and people got really excited. Did they not? Uh, 
Uh, quick two things, just so you know. I know that uh, here Marx is apathena and it means be opened. You're thinking, well, why are we getting a translation? Why don't we just have be opened? Well, it's the Hebrew word that's being used and it's just proving that Mark is writing to non-Hebrew speakers. This letter is to those who are non-Hebrew speakers. But this miracle for me here is showing that Jesus saved, hope restored, ground reclaimed in this man. By the way, do you also know that Jesus was probably using not something new and different, stand up for a minute, Stephen, no jokes, I ain't got time. But that and that and the spittle, by the way, just to let you know, that wasn't something new. Within Jewish, some Jewish thinking, the spittle of particular people, the spit, wasn't seen as something nasty, but actually seen as having healing power. And within Gentile land, people would put balm on a tongue to try and heal stuff. So the whole point that God was using, or Jesus was using, some of the cultural practices that they would use to bring something about. Do you see the point? So God sometimes actually does use our cultural practices that we have today to bring about his word and his kingdom. Even texts from somebody at the right moment can bring about God's will and purpose. So let's not read our Bible and think we should get all back to that way of being. God actually uses even the stuff that we have today to bring about his purposes. Cheers, Dave. Again, Jesus uses, we have in here, Mark, that secrecy motif that Jesus doesn't want the crowd to tell anybody. It's not because he's saying, I'm so humble, don't tell people. What it is, is it's, he doesn't want people to get the wrong idea of what he is as a saver, saviour, as a messiah, as a miracle healer. They, he doesn't want people to think he's there to overthrow the political powers of Rome in a warlike way. He doesn't want them to misunderstand them, so he's trying to keep it quiet. And as you remember, the dog, woman, servant uh, moment, he was trying to be in a room on his own. But the crowd completely are so amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. What a response. Excitement about who Jesus is. Could you just um, read that with me? I'm going to read it again. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. They're excited about who Jesus is. When was the last time you was excited about who Jesus is? All the time, seven days a week, 24-7. No matter how he answers the prayer. So, Debbie, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, bound, I'm not expecting you to answer, Debbie. <laughs> when was the last time you was excited about Jesus being in your life? Or is it, I'm excited about Jesus being in my life when I'm in trouble and I need his help? When was the last time you excitedly went up to someone who doesn't know him and went, Jesus loves you? Do you know what he can do for you? <laughs> yeah, I'm running around like that because that's what we should be doing internally. <laughs> Steve's only like that when Chelsea win. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Do we wake up in the morning? Do I wake up in the morning? By the way, it's not just everybody else, it's just me as well. Do I wake up in the morning going, Jesus is here? And I wake up in the morning going, got to feed the cat. Oh man, I've got to go swimming. Do you wake up with a sense of excitement of how amazing he really is? What he has done in 
your life and what he's capable of doing in the lives of others. If you're honest, then your answer to that question is, no, six and a half days of the week, I'm probably not quite that excited. Then maybe we need to ask God, because only he can do it, to put that excitement back into us. I'm sure you can remember when you first got baptised and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. The joy of the Lord was in you. And yes, it's absolutely right. And then things do calm down slightly. But they shouldn't calm down to the point where we look around life with no hope. We look at the bleakness and dreariness of life with no hope. With a sense of, oh, there should be sometimes elements of excitement that Jesus is here. God is present. I can have a one-to-one with the creator and sustainer of the universe. I can have a one-to-one with him who broke my chains. I can have a one-to-one with him for my brother, my sister, my parents, or whatever, and go on, friends and family. I can have a one-to-one with him. I can actually wake up in the very presence of the living God and be with him and walk with him, even when I'm shopping in the supermarket. Not deciding whether I should have Heinz or the brand name or the shop brand name. I can be excited that Jesus is with me and I'm here to be a blessing to others. I got excited reading that. Did you get excited reading that? Or have you all just feel like oh. you can ask God to put the excitement back into you? So, let's pray. Give you a moment. Lord, as I think about the fact that actually this morning we blessed blessing. And we recognise that we are blessed by you. We recognise, Lord, that we are to be a blessing to others for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, help, I ask that you help each of us to be listening to your will. Not just in our lives, but most certainly in the lives of others that you want to bless. And Lord, for those of us here this morning who have lost that excitement of knowing you, being with you, that excitement and expectation of what you can do, Lord, I ask by your spirit, you will bless those inner parts, bring alive Remove the dross and the covering and the the rubbish that has laid over that joy of knowing the Lord. Bless us, Lord, so we can be a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.